Welcome everybody to Crow Canyon's webinar this week. My name is Mark Varian. I'm one of the archaeologists at uh, Crow Canyon Archaeological Center, and I'm really pleased to be the moderator for this webinar, which is titled Prehistoric Irrigation in Central Utah, More Than at First Glance, uh, with a very distinguished anthropologist, anthropological archaeologist, Dr. Steve Sims. We want to thank all of you uh, for supporting this webinar series, uh, because without you, we wouldn't have been able to do it. And you're really the ones who have uh, made the difference in allowing Crow Canyon as a nonprofit to put on this series every week. I'm gonna try and move through these introductory slides quick to not cut into Steve's time, but I wanted to begin by just going through some logistics. Uh, I know a lot of you have done previous webinars, so you know this. But Steve's PowerPoint will show up on your screen, and then he, he will show up as a talking head, and you can it'll be a vertical split in your screen, and you can drag that vertical split to the right to minimize the talking head and uh, make the uh, PowerPoint slides larger. There will be a live transcription text at the bottom, and I'd say it gets about 90% of the words correct. Uh, it's been really helpful uh, for people that need that transcription. Um, there's a Q&A button that you'll see on the bottom of your screen, and that's where you can submit your questions. For the most part, we'll take questions at the end of the talk, although if I see one that it's appropriate to interrupt Steve, I'll go ahead and do that. But mostly we'll be taking questions at the end of the talk, and uh, we really appreciate getting your questions. If you're having any difficulties with this Zoom stream, uh, you can go to Crow Canyon's Facebook page at that address there and stream the talk from there as well. Also, if you wanna go back and hear parts of this talk that you miss or parts that you're interested in, um, you can go to Crow Canyon's YouTube page and we will publish this talk tomorrow on our YouTube page. And you can also watch all of the previous webinars uh, from that page. Um, Crow Canyon, I don't know how many people have ever been there or know who we are, but uh, we're a nonprofit located just outside of Cortez, Colorado, and our mission is to empower present and future generations by making the human past accessible and relevant through archaeological research, experiential education, and American Indian knowledge. Uh, that's our website. I'd really encourage you to go there. It's got lots of research and educational materials. Uh, that's a picture of our campus behind it. Uh, it's a 110 acre campus with Sleeping Ute Mountain, the iconic peak of the Four Corners uh, right in back of us. Um, the Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges Pueblo Diné, Hickory, Apache people on whose traditional lands our institution sits. I need to move my uh, box because I'm I lost some of that. Pueblo Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people. Our mission-related work would not be possible without indigenous peoples in the past, present, and future. We respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. Uh, we have two uh, webinars every Thursday, and the next two are going to be really exciting. Uh, the very well-known author, Douglas Preston, will be giving a talk next Thursday called The Lost City of the Monkey God. And two weeks from today will be a, a talk that's co-sponsored by Crow Canyon, the Hisatsunam chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society, and the Four Corners Lecture Series. And that will be Basket Weaving in the Mesa Verde Tradition by Dr. Ed Jolie. And I'm really looking forward to that talk. Um, we've all been hit hard over the last year by the pandemic, uh, but indigenous nations have been hit especially hard. These are a, a group of organizations that you can provide support to those indigenous nations to help them through this difficult time. So this might be a slide that you wanna go back to on YouTube to get those addresses to look them up and help them with a donation for their relief funds. Okay, the title of our talk is Prehistoric Irrigation in Central Utah, More Than at First Glance. 
and it's being pre presented by Dr. Steve Sims, who is a professor emeritus at Utah. Sorry, I moved my screen. Utah State uh, University in, in Logan, Utah. Steve has conducted archeological field work across the United States and in the Middle East for over 45 years. His area of specialty are prehistory of the Great Basin and the Colorado Plateau, the science of evolutionary ecology, archeological method and theory, history and theories of anthropology. He's written several books including his 2008 book, Ancient Peoples of the Great Basin, and his award-winning book, Traces of Fremont Society, Rock Art in Ancient Utah, which was published in 2010, and which won the Society for American Archaeology Book Award for the best book written for the public about archaeology. He's directed over 60 archaeological projects and has done a tremendous amount of professional service including uh, president of the Great Basin Anthropological Association, the editor of Utah Archaeology, serving on the Society for American uh, Archaeology Governmental Affairs Committee, uh, uh, serving on the Utah Governor's Committee that drafted Utah's version of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and there's more that I'm not going to state in this introduction. He continues to conduct research uh, in retirement, including working with a colleague, Jeff Clapp, on a, on a research trip that's coming up on ancient peoples of the LaSalle borderlands in the area around Moab. So we're very grateful for Steve uh, for being with us tonight and taking the time to put together this webinar and give it to you this evening. So Steve, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to you. We're not seeing anything from your screen yet, Steve. There we go. Perfect, we can see it now. Perfect. Got it. You can go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, thank you, Mark, for the introduction and uh, Thanks to Crow Canyon Archaeological Center and, and to Taylor Hasbrook, our, our expert that makes this happen. Um, my title uh, that you'll see on the screen is slightly different from the one that we uh, posted, an unusual prehistoric irrigation system in central Utah. Um, some of what you uh, may encounter here, uh, you might kind of wonder, wow, is this real, but remember, this is April Fools. Uh, for those of you that want to get into the, uh, the, this uh, material a little bit deeper, there is a published paper. Uh, the citation is shown on the, on the PowerPoint screen. And it appeared in American Antiquity last summer. Um, I'm going to just kind of skim the surface here and go for about 30 to 35 minutes so we have ample time for, for questions. But I would like to not just dwell on this irrigation system as interesting as it is and move on to some larger implications because the dating that we uh, found in this case is uh, unusual. How am I it's not advancing? You may have to click the bottom of your screen on those two arrows there that you see on that toolbar to advance your screen during the screen share. There we go. Here's our location. Uh, Pleasant Creek Irrigation uh, Site is just outside of Capitol Reef National Park near Torrey, Utah. Uh, as long as this map of the Southwest is up, one thing I always try to point out is when we think of irrigation in the Southwest, we often think of Hohokam irrigation 
or and it's nothing like that. This is extremely mundane, small water. Uh, nor is it like the early agricultural period uh, floodplain irrigation in the Tucson area. I just like to throw that out because I, I, I've never seen anything like this. And, and I think there's a, only a few other cases in the Southwest where there's something this rustic. But you notice we are north of the Colorado River in the Fremont uh, culture area. Here's an overview of the, of the beautiful terrain. We're looking across Net Capital Reef National Park at the Henry Mountains. It shows the route of the canal. Uh, Jorgensen Flat at the left is the target. That's the farm uh, area, arable land they were farming. And way up at the upper right in the picture, you see the shoulder of a mountain. That's Navajo Mountain in Arizona. The Claflin Emerson expedition of the uh, 1920s uh, named the Fremont culture and named it after the Fremont River, which flows through Capitol Reef. And Noel Morse had one paragraph uh, early in this monograph, and it's excerpted here, that identified an ancient irrigation ditch. I knew of this when I was an undergraduate at the University of Utah in the early 1970s. And uh, I guess I'm not the only one who's uh, never bothered to go out and see if they could find this thing. In 2010, uh, I decided I'd give it a shot and I uh, quietly by myself went down there armed with uh, this monograph and looked for it. I was not successful the first several times. Uh, the second, uh, uh, sentence, it was a shallow depression two feet wide and looked similar to the natural channels and sheep trails in the vicinity. All I can say is how true. There were, it seemed that there were myriad possibilities. But over the next uh, year or so, I kept going back and, and took uh, some help and we finally uh, pieced this thing together. Here's a Google Earth shot. We are looking east toward Capitol Reef. Uh, the yellow strip is the highway from Torrey to Boulder, Utah. And the little thin orange line shows the general route of the irrigation ditch. The intake is at 8,400 feet. And they had to take the water at that point. If they waited any longer, it would be lost into the deeply incised Pleasant Creek which sequestered the water all the way to Capitol Reef. So it was odd and Morse had said that they took water from the head of Pleasant Creek and that's seven kilometers away from Jorgensen Flat. And I don't think I could get that in my head at the time, which is one of the reasons I couldn't understand the system. He really did mean the head of Pleasant Creek. If they hadn't taken it there, another 50 feet or so downstream, it dives off a steep slope and cascades into the very deep Pleasant Creek Canyon. Here's what the canal grade looks like uh, farther down. And here's a place that Morse mentioned specifically uh, that his guides, uh, these were local farmers who showed in this, and they said, see, here's where the uh, ancient people had hugged these rocks, these basalt boulders, uh, that we would have used our teams of horses to move out of the way. And when we dug here, indeed, uh, we found the canal up against these. They had, to, they had to do that because if they lost the water out of, to the right of this photograph, uh, they would have lost it back into Pleasant Creek. It wouldn't have made it on to where they wanted it to go. That's a shot of Jordan's flat. Acres of arable land. Uh, engineers at the Utah Water Research Laboratory uh, helped us model this, and they showed that a very small amount of water running 24 7 over the course of about a month could water these uh, sands, almost a meter deep of uh, porous sands. Here's an overview of the system. Uh, the dashed sections of, that you see here are places where they didn't di actually dig the irrigation ditch. They just let the water find its way down a gentle slope. 
uh, the solid lines are where they actually constructed ditch on one to two percent grades. Uh, what they're doing here is they're minimizing their capital costs while accepting higher maintenance costs. Uh, but this is a very small water system. It only moved about one and a half cubic feet per second. Uh, one notable thing is you'll see in the center right lower bounds reservoir. That was constructed in the 1920s and 30s and used the same intake. Uh, in fact, the people who constructed it knew that they were building this on an old uh, system. But what happened is because they were moving so much more water, the part of the system above Lower Bounds Reservoir is uh, really very eroded. So we knew that that section was unlikely to reveal any evidence of the antiquity of the system. Uh, at the early stage, we had, had no idea. Um, the excavation, because we thought that that was the section that mo was most likely to harbor sediments that were we could uh, have a chance of, of dating. Okay. We surveyed the site records of this area, and there are 109 sites in, in the area you see here. Uh, down at the lower left, you see the intake and then the terminus of the irrigation ditch. And of these 109 sites, 49 of them can be dated or have a cultural affiliation. And of those 49, 43 are Fremont. There's one late prehistoric site and five archaic sites. Well, when we started digging, we in, indeed uh, in the very first trenches encountered the canal. Uh, in the lower right, you see me pointing to a section that we could follow uh, in a linear section, not just a cross section. But here's a standard cross section. Uh, we dug nine excavations and then all but one, what you see here is what we found. A lower U-shaped channel that marks the irrigation ditch canal and then after it was abandoned and filled with sediments you see a u-shaped upper channel which was water natural rainwater running down an, ab an abandoned ditch grade it was this kind of section that we were able to calculate the uh, capacity of the system we used a magnetometer and ground penetrating radar uh, first on Jorgensen Flat, just to see if how they put the water onto the field. Uh, in some of these places in the Southwest, there's some elaborate uh, infrastructure that distributes the water. But in this case, uh, you see these dendritic patterns. This is in the magnetic radiometer survey, showing that they just allowed the water to distribute itself across this gentle slope of Jorgensen Flat, relying on the fact that these uh, sands would uh, trans transport the water uh, along. And at our irrigation experts at the Water Resource Lab uh, acknowledged that that's what would happen in this case. Uh, these porous Navajo sandstone sands transmit water very effectively. Now on to the interesting part, the chronology. Uh, here it shows us uh, uh, driving a piece of tubing into a profile at the appropriate location where we think we might be able to get a date. OSL is optically stimulated luminescence. It measures the elapsed time since a grain of sand was last exposed to light. a grain of sand rolling down the uh, bottom of an irrigation ditch uh, and it's as it rolls the sun is hitting it and it zeroes out the clock it's called bleaching the water stops new sediments come in and bury that layer and the clock starts ticking 
So the idea is to date the last time it was exposed to light. Now, this dating technique has been around for decades and it's vastly improved uh, in the last couple of decades. Um, the quartz sands in our canals, because the parent rock is Navajo sandstone, are absolutely ideal for this dating method. Now, my colleague and the co-author on our work, Tammy Rittenauer, shown here, uh, she's uh, dated quite a bit of, uh, of uh, irrigation systems. She dated the early canals on the Santa Cruz River near Tucson, uh, worked with Gary Huckleberry there, as well as other historic cases of irrigation in the Southwest that have to do with water rights. Um, she's the director of the Utah State University Optically Stimulated Luminescence Laboratory. And notably, our samples were subjected to the most advanced and laborious method of OSL dating called single grain analysis. It's where a sample of sand grains, typically 100, are measured for their luminescence signal individually, rather than a, as a bulk sample of sands. It allows you to really understand the nature of that sample and uh, it makes it much more statistically uh, uh, understandable. So you can see the date that she, uh, from the very the place that she's uh, pointing to where she pounded in a pipe. Uh, she removed that pipe and it's capped it and it's taken back to the lab. The reason it's, uh, there's a big hole there is we excavate the sands around the sample so we get a background luminescence signal to help calibrate the date. Uh, her date range shown here of AD 1594 to 1834 uh, is much too early to be historic irrigation, um, but it's probably not the 1594 date either because of partially partial bleaching uh, as it's uh, ex explained here. Uh, each time a canal is used, earlier sediments are washed away or partially exposed to light obscuring the record of previous use, but also leaving a, uh, a luminescent signature, which could include some later, later materials or partially bleached sand grains. Here's uh, a, a Google Earth image of the area of the canal that, where the, our excavations occurred. As I said earlier, all but one of our trenches produce this very simple stratigraphic uh, sequence. Um, what we needed to do was search for a place that might yield greater complexity uh, with the chance that maybe something from an earlier time might be preserved or multiple trenches. Um, I had uh, walked this dozens, if not a hundred times. And each time I went by the area of trench five, right in the center, I had kind of ignored it because it was on a bend. You can see the red line of the ditch. They were getting ready and the water direction is left to right here. They needed to take the canal across a drainage. And so the contour had to be real tight there, a hairpin turn. And to prepare for that, they had to curve the canal. Those, those are real and they tend to fail. And indeed, this one had the area below trench five to the rut was just all jumbled up. We call it dissected, heavily eroded. And I, I think I had suspected that, well, there's got to be nothing here. This is just all torn up. Well, it turned out that uh, trench five was exactly what we were looking for. Here's a, uh, our main profile in trench five. It's 1.2 meters high. And uh, this is one of those where I could stay on this slide for an hour, but I won't. What I wanna point out for today is the lower sediment package marked by the brown arrow at the bottom. This is our early irrigation event. AD 1460 to 1600. Directly above it, marked by the blue arrow, is where 
humans deposited masses of charcoal rich sediment. Charcoal was littering the ground area along this stretch of the canal. And in this case, the, these were massive chunks, uh, not, not stratified, but jumbled. Uh, it looked anthropogenic and the, it contained a lot of charcoal. And unlike most of the charcoal you see in irrigation canals, which is very rounded and eroded, this charcoal was angular. It had not been deposited by water. It made it ideal for dating. And notice that the date 1470 to 1640, that is statistically identical to the OSL date. So we have an OSL date on the lower package and we have a radiocarbon date, an AMSC 14 date on the anthropogenic fill. Uh, I can't prove it, but my gut feeling is that they're putting the sediment in here to reset the grade of the canal. Uh, they get a rainstorm and it can wash things out. And sometimes you need to modify the floor of the canal so that you can continue to use it. Uh, finally, uh, the upper uh, package marked by the gray arrow is the historic period irrigation that Noel Morse had observed and that the farmers who worked with Noel Morse knew about. Uh, and you see a group of, of late dates. Those are all OSL dates. Um, even though we know that the historic irrigation was no earlier than the 1920s on this stretch of Pleasant Creek, uh, notice that the latest date is 1910. Uh, that's again, a function of this partial bleaching, um, which can leave some sands which give an older signature. So we have had a, these are unusually uh, late dates and I'll come back to that point. Uh, for this, uh, this is another uh, a presentation of style. But here, I'll only note that in addition to our excavations to attempt to date the canals, uh, one of our graduate students uh, did a master's thesis uh, doing experimental archaeology over the course of two years, digging canal, making dams, letting the spring runoff blow, uh, wash the dams away, and measuring the costs of constructing this canal in the, in, in, in the various kinds of sediment that we encountered along the uh, 7.2 kilometer canal route. Um, wonderful project uh, and uh, Chimalise Kuhn is the author and that's the citation for her thesis. And it is, this is available online. All you would have to do is Google Chimalise Kuhn and this will come up. Uh, what she found is that Despite the high labor costs to build and maintain an irrigation system, the increase in the productivity per unit of land, not a bushels per acre, for instance, is so increased that it offsets those high labor costs. So the orange bar you see in the middle, that's the average for our system. It's right in the middle of the full range of indigenous irrigated agriculture. And there've been a number of studies, uh, not only in the Western United States, but elsewhere in the world to try to get a handle on the agricultural economics of uh, simple irrigation. It's also in the envelope of dry and rainfall farming. Let's see, what else did I wanna say about, yeah, in the ballpark is what I would say. So the cost of this irrigation system is comparable to dry farming. But beyond cost, uh, it's possible that irrigation is favored partially, maybe more than partially, because it mitigates the risk of total crop failure. In fact, in a situation like this, this may be more important than cost, given cost is a wash. You can dry farm or you can irrigate, and it's going to cost you about the same. But in this case, north of the Colorado River, some form of irrigation may be more important because the summer monsoon uh, is weaker and less frequent than just uh, 50 to 100 miles south in the Four Corners region. 
um, it's the kind of a situation where if you don't get your August summer, summer monsoon north of the Colorado River, you spent the entire summer tending a maize crop that you could lose completely. So for the Fremont, irrigation may be essential. These economics imply that irrigation should be practiced wherever the hydrological and topographic conditions permit. And there's a project there using uh, ArcGIS uh, and some modeling of what, let the computer show you the least cost pathway to where an irrigation canal should be have the computer tell you where this could be, and then you get your backpack on and you go out and see if you can find it. That project has yet to happen. Now, uh, back to, to the dating. Oops, sorry, wrong, wrong screen. Now, we can't show who irrigated at Pleasant Creek because the archeological sites that you find along an irrigation ditch are not necessarily associated in a behavioral sense. Um, the sites that we did find or know, and know about are overwhelmingly Fremont and we know that Fremont were irrigators. Um, but AD 1460 to 1636 by traditional measures is after the, the, the demise of the Fremont. The Fremont aren't supposed to be here anymore, but not so fast. There are at least seven Fremont sites in uh, Utah and Northwestern Colorado, that's the oval, uh, that date between 1420 and 1550. There are also historic accounts of ancient irrigation systems, similar to the one that Noel Morse uh, wrote about. Those are the dots. Uh, these are cases where farmers took archaeologists out, just like Morse was taken out, and said, see, our ancestors, the Mormon pioneers, we built our irrigation ditches on top of existing and ancient ditches. So those are, uh, I wouldn't say they're common, but they're scattered around the Fremont area. Further, there are several excavated irrigation features at Fremont sites. Those are the plus signs. The clearest case is Steinecker Reservoir near Vernal, Utah, where uh, very clear uh, irrigation ditches were followed. Uh, there's also a, a published account that's in the center of the state at Mathis Village uh, near the town of Salina. And then there's the case of Median Village near the town of Cedar City, which has a, uh, a, an irrigation-like uh, structure. Uh, that's inconclusive because the excavators back in the early 70s had no idea what they were looking at. Uh, but th the evidence is out there. And then the diamond, uh, again, marks our case that we're talking about here. So implications and questions. This, this uh, bullet number one, the demise of farming was neither temporally uniform nor were the results everywhere similar. Uh, that's a quote from a paper that was written in 1986. The Fremont didn't end all at once, but the living Puebloan tribes of the Southwest attest that farming and the cultures of the Southwest did not vanish. They did not disappear, as I was told as a child when I toured Mesa Verde in the late 1950s. And they were not mysteriously lost. And this would include the Fremont, uh, sort of the uh, stepchild of Southwestern archeology. span I and, and, a, and a fair number of archeologists are, uh, see the Fremont as Puebloan, but because they have no real obvious tie to the living tribes, not as obvious as Mesa Verde and Chaco and those places do. They're kind of the forgotten uh, stepchild. They didn't disappear either. They are represented in the living Southwestern tribes, 
some of the candidates are Hopi and, and other North American tribes, including the Kiowa. That's another presentation though. Number two, irrigation of Pleasant Creek between 1460 and 1636, supposedly after the termination of farming north of the Colorado River, uh, to me serves as a mundane symbol of cultural continuity between the ancient and modern tribes. And I think this potentially includes a lot more than the Puebloan. Uh, I, the standard taxonomy is that once the Fremont went away, the Southern Paiute and the Ute moved in and they were different peoples. And the dating on all that is really not well understood. And I think that's uh, an open book. Um, it's possible that Fremont was highly you know, multi-ethnic. Uh, we're, we're, we run a lot of danger with this kind of material of uh, identifying people by their pots or their, or their arrowheads. And the situation might have been more like what was raised in, is raised in bullet number three. The Southwest was a great diversity in culture, scattered groups of hunters, survivals of the pre-Neolithic uh, farming economy among migratory horticulturalists. That name, B. Gordon Child, and that quote is from 1951, were phrases used to describe the Middle East of 10,000 years ago at the dawn of farming by the great archeologist B. Gordon Child. He knew that the spread of farming was more of, a, than a, more of a sprinkling of new ways than it was a wave of advancing progress. In the Southwest, in 1994, the archaeologist Stedman Upham, and I'll come back to him in a minute, reminded Southwestern archaeology of Child's foresight as he uh, wrote about this quote. And what Upham was attempting to do is move beyond the telling of history as a sequence of cultures, one replacing the other, a fiction of progress among monolithic cultural entities. Bullet number four, the Fremont north of the Colorado River may exemplify a landscape where people of different heritages are thrown together and end up learning each other's life ways, languages, beliefs, sometimes moving in together, marriages, children, where children learn to make a basket from a mother of one heritage and an aunt from another heritage causing the basket to have attributes of multiple traditions. We see these things. A place where farming often fails and some people might have to leave while others shift to a foraging lifestyle since they have been so close to that lifestyle all their lives. Upham called this residential cycling. So this late case of irrigation, supposedly after the Fremont, vanished or were lost is might rather than that model for understanding might be better understood by thinking of residential cycling among lifeways across space and through times so the historic tribes north of the colorado and san juan rivers are the southern paiute and the ute as i have mentioned their presence is well established to the West in the Great Basin by AD 1000. And a strong case can be made that these groups and their languages spread across the Colorado Plateau as early as 2000 years ago. That means they're in the area while the Fremont are in the area, whoever the Fremont are. Now the case of Pleasant Creek and our late dates can't resolve this proposal but it does tilt us toward a perspective which has been out there in, in Southwestern archeology span for decades, but is starting to make a resurgence. It's a perspective where non-Puebloan peoples interacted with ancestral Puebloan and Fremont peoples. 
not just through the well-worn metaphors of, oh, well, they had trade and exchange, or the culturally biased term, well, they intermarried, but through residential cycling, fostering continuous ethnogenesis, even as it ensured cultural continuity. Now, I don't wanna push this too far, even though it is April Fools. Uh, I want to uh, suggest some avenues of exploration. I applaud the recent work of Denny Seymour and those who contributed to the volume cited here, as well as her efforts to raise awareness of the non-Puebloan world in the American Southwest that maybe didn't come just after the Puebloans uh, shifted where they farmed and abandoned certain areas, but might have been out there uh, for a lot longer. Stedman Upham in this piece and several others dating to the 1980s was ahead of his time. And in my opinion, some did not see what he was saying all those years ago with concepts such as residential cycling and alerting archeologists that these weak archeological signatures of hunters and gatherers among the strong archeological signals of Pueblos created what he called an underclass of Southwestern prehistory. And then finally, my own efforts in this regard uh, employed the warning from the great ethnologist, Eric Wolf, that accused anthropologists uh, with our concepts and all of our labels as threatening to turn names into things. As we pursue the will of the wisp of social order and integration in a world of upheaval and change. Now I brought this perspective from the Great Basin where the weak archeological signatures of foraging societies are for us routine. Thank you for allowing me to present this work and make some suggestions about perspective. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Steve. That was a fantastic talk. Very interesting. We do have some questions. I'll start with the first one, which is phrased, it's, it's a really good question. Uh, it says, do you think that the Fremont could do cost benefit analyses? Question, or do you think they could have known that irrigation would pay off from reports from outside sources, say the Hohokam? <laughs> Anybody who's uh, including an illiterate farmer in medieval France knew every move and what it cost. They didn't have to calculate it. They knew it as rules of thumb. Uh, many, many years ago when I was first studying evolutionary ecology, which is really microeconomics, uh, um, one of my professors, was on my doctoral committee, Eric Charnoff, uh, boy genius, we used to call him. Uh, he had a slide of a hunter gatherer uh, holding up a, a, a personal calculator, sitting at a campfire, doing the cost benefit analysis. Uh, <laughs> of course, they're not doing that. Uh, but were they aware of the best way to do things and the, the, the ways that, uh, uh, that saved them time and got them more food? intimate knowledge of their environment, absolutely. And in terms of the benefit side of cost benefits, they would have understood yields. Absolutely. And the, and the effect that irrigation had on yields. Yeah, the, the models that we use for this kind of thing, which are out of animal behavior theory, and actually, if you really look at the history of the, the intellectual history, uh, but these are microeconomic models that have been very successful with predicting uh, human behavior, such as careful shopper theory that every retailer uses, Walmart uses it all the time. And then they, uh, biologists back in the 1960s started asking, well, I wonder if this works to explain bird behavior. And sure enough, it did. Uh, one of my professors pushed back on this back in the 80s, the, the famous Dr. Jesse Jennings. He said, since 
what do a bunch of birds have to do with humans? And I just had to point out that actually, Dr. Jennings, it was what we know about humans that enabled us to understand natural selection of, of the behavior of birds. It's the other way around. So we're not, we're not jamming animal behavior onto human behavior. Odd, oddly enough, it's exactly the opposite. So the models help us think about these things and uh, see some of the same trade-offs that people who lived in, in, in the past or who live now, uh, how, uh, it helps us explain why the cultural path took one way rather than any number of other ways. It, hel it helps us uh, model it and generates hypotheses for test. Yes. All right, I got another question. Did you find any lithic material in your excavations? And if so, what did it contribute to your analysis? Well, because we're searching for an irrigation ditch, uh, we, we, we could have found some lithics, but we did not. Uh, there were some lithics on the surface along the canal route and an occasional projectile point um, uh, and an occasional pot shirt. There was a fair amount of ground stone, broken up manos and matates along the route. Uh, we, did, we only found one artifact in our nine excavations in the ditch, and it was a Fremont ceramic shirt. Now, that could have been much older than the ditch and just fell in at some point. Uh, so it doesn't really uh, speak to anything. Okay, um, I have a question. Have you contacted Paiute or Ute modern groups about current irrigation practices? If so, what characteristics do their current day practice, how, what do they look like and do they resemble the ones you reconstructed? Uh, the, the Southern Paiute irrigation known is in a different part of Utah uh, where you have it's down near the St. George and Kanab area. And it was very uh, informal. It was in the, in the 19th century uh, when it was known. Um, and, uh, that there, there, is, there, is, there is no irrigation going on uh, now. Mm -hmm. You know, I have Ute friends from our neighboring Ute Mountain Ute tribe, and some of them emphasize that they wanted no part of farming. And yet, um, there is a historic uh, William Henry Jackson photograph in Montezuma Creek, which is just a few canyons to the west of here, of some either Ute or Paiute cornfields in the distance beyond an archaeological site that he was photographing in 1874. So, yes, I, uh, it's difficult to generalize to a people from the opinion of one and mm -hmm. modern America ought to be a pretty good example. <laughs> right. there, there is variability in, among all these uh, groups uh, and, and ethnographies of living hunter-gatherers have all, all clearly show that within the, any group of, of foragers, there's an, a range of opinions about what is appropriate to be doing. And some uh, may move into farming uh, others say, well, I'm never going to do that. Um, right. So I have a question. Uh, is there evidence of the crops that were grown with this irrigation system that you documented? Well, for this time period, it would have to be the, the only ones we know about. This is maize based. We did not take the, the next step for this project would be to try to uh, go down to the field and do some pollen work. But what I'm reporting on here is just about the irrigation system itself. Uh, our goal was to find it uh, and see if it was ancient as Noel Morse contended. Um, there's a lot more that could be done with this, uh, whether well, it's maize along with beans and squash, who, who knows. And does the modeling that you did with your irrigation experts tell you the size of the field that was um, irrigated by this canal? Uh, yes, it was, it's up to 90 acres. Wow. Uh, that's, ge ge that's geologically. And so we're not saying that they irrigated that much. Uh, it's just that we have a 
uh, Jorgensen Flat has deep sands over about 90 acres. And with the water volumes that we're, we have, one and a half cubic feet per second, you can, you can water that much in this kind of sediment in about 28 days. So you I'm just keep the that. water running 24 seven. That's amazing. So it's the kind of a system that may be not used every year. Uh, yeah. I, there could come a year where somebody decides, let's uh, go back to whatever they call this place and activate the system, get it prepped, run water onto the field, and then let it go. They wouldn't have to water it again for months. So I'm gonna combine a question I have with one that uh, somebody wrote in. Given that, the, the potential size of this area, do you have an estimate of the size of the social group that was using and maintaining this canal and are there sites in the area where you could identify people living in those sites and estimate the size of the social group from those sites? Well, yeah, I put up that one slide showing the, uh, the abundance of archeological sites in the area and they are overwhelmingly Fremont. Um, because in archeology, span the problem of association is uh, significant and this even more so in this case, just because a, an archeological site is near an irrigation canal that is seven kilometers long, doesn't mean it has any relationship whatsoever. It's not, you can't do this stratigraphically because uh, it, it, it just can't be done. Mm -hmm. uh, if we, if we chanced and excavated a site that produced dates in the 14s or 15, 1600s, now we're on a little bit firmer ground. Now, having said this, I, I will say that within a half of a kilometer of, the, of the, where the excavations were uh, is a very large Fremont site. It's never been excavated. It's got a bunch of pit houses on it. Uh, but you know, even when you excavate these sites, archaeology is in a bad position to actually tell you how many people lived at a place at any given moment. We're good at telling you what the total site size was, uh, and we can sometimes tell you trends when the population is increasing or decreasing, but putting an actual number on places is pretty rare. Even if you have a lot of tree ring dating in a Pueblo, it's hard to do. So now having said that, I will say that about three to four kilometers downstream uh, from Jorgensen Flat, the field that they're farming, are very large Fremont sites. Uh, they're right inside Capitol Reef National Park, and it's, it's a Fremont hotspot, and that's long been known. So this is an area where during the Fremont period, now, now we're talking AD 1000s and 1100s, uh, it was heavily used. Uh, villages, uh, maybe not villages on the scale that you see in the Southwest, uh, like in the Cortez area, but uh, significant sized villages in the world of Fremont. Uh, that's about all, all we can say. Uh, but I would remind people that Fremont farming is, they have a central place as a village, but what these people are doing, and the same with the Puebloans, is task groups go out and work these places. And so uh, they're moving the labor to where it needs to be at any place in the agricultural cycle. Um, so it's not like there's a, a village and then right next door is the field. The fields can be very widely scattered as the people move the labor to where it needs to be. Um, but uh, it was a pretty big deal when this was being used, most likely. The odd part is that this is happening after the, the Fremont supposedly disappeared, which I would argue, eh, I'm hardly the only one. They didn't, they weren't gone. They're still farming in certain places mm -hmm. at this late time. Um, I have a question. Did the Fremont and Hohokam know about each other and know about each other's irrigation methods? Uh, the irrigation is so different, I wouldn't say there's any necessary connection at all. 
Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll use a, a line from Steve Lexon. Everybody knew everything. <laughs> right. Right. I think people had knowledge of their landscape uh, far and wide, far beyond their own personal travels. Uh, they may not have gone to Chaco or to Snake Town, but they had heard about it. I, I, I think that's a very good reminder. And uh, these people did not live isolated lives. Uh, I, I really resist this tendency to make these people seem like they're just animals barely surviving on a landscape. They had a full and rich life. Thank you. And they didn't need the whole com to show them how to irrigate. Uh -huh. But it is interesting. We could be missing if the dates are accurate. And it sounds like you, especially because you dated that cultural fill above your OSL dates, that you're convinced that those 1400 and later dates are accurate. And as opposed to still being anomalously late and that these ditches could go with earlier Fremont occupations. Is that? Yeah, yes, that was one angle that I, I, I just didn't uh, go into, but uh, let's, let's, uh, let's quickly show something here. People are asking, writing in questions, asking where are the occupation sites that go with this irrigation system? We, we can't know that because of the problem of association. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the, the, you know, some of the water works at Chaco that Gwen Vivian has been working on, there's no way to associate that with uh, Chetro Ketel or Pueblo Bonito. They might be, but archeologically, there's no way to show that in, in a behavioral sense. I was asked that on some of our grant proposals. Why don't you go dig the sites nearby? Because I have no way to behaviorally associate a site with this place, even if it was in the same ballpark of dating. But let me point out something on this slide that that'll, is, is pretty intriguing and puts our late date in context. We have geomorphic evidence that this ditch grade existed prior to this event. And it's that V-shaped erosion on the left-hand side in the photograph, you can see it says V-shaped erosion. This is an entrenchment event. That means that someone had built this ditch grade that virtually parallels the contours. So it's not a natural drainage. It, and they did it uh, prior to this sequence that you're seeing here. In other words, everything you're seeing here was deposited after a major flood event eroded everything that was already there. So geologically, we cannot date when the canal was first built, but it remains possible that this canal dates deep into Fremont times and was used repeatedly. One of the tricks of dating irrigation is that every time a ditch is used, it destroys the earlier events which is why in our, in our simple trenches with only the one uh, lower U-shaped canal in it, we didn't see early dates. We were only seeing the last use of the canal. So now we've long known this, and the, uh, this, is the, this is the rub here, uh, just finding uh, irrigation canal alignments, I call them grades on the surface does not mean that you're going to be able to find the true age of the first use of that system. And uh, right, right. I, I know this personally because I was an irrigator in Logan, Utah for 20 years. I was an owner of a water share and you know, a fairly primitive system. And you could see that each, each year when you watered, all the sediments from the previous year were taken away and remodeled. And you'll never know that that system was constructed in the 19th century as I was using it in 2005. <laughs> well, I um, happened to go down to look at some archeology span in McElmo Creek earlier today and all along the creek, it's the time of year that everybody's out cleaning ditches. So yeah. those ditches also get cleaned every single year. Yes. Um, so I have another question that you could and probably did teach 
uh, graduate seminars on, and that question is, I am confused. Who are the Fremont? Can you say something more about who they are thought to be and who you see them as? Yes, I, I, I see them in the same way that when we use the old word Anasazi. As a professor, I've been asked hundreds of times, well, what language is Anasazi? Well, it's probably a bunch of different languages, which we know now because the descendants of the Anasazi or ancestral Puebloan are the Hopi, the Tewa, the Keres, and on and on, and even the Navajo. And uh, it has been in the Fremont literature for several decades that the Fremont could be multi-ethnic. There is some distinction between Colorado Plateau and the Eastern Great Basin Fremont. There's distinctions in the rock art, some of the basketry a little bit. Uh, I think John Ives works work at Promontory Caves in Northern Utah shows that there is an uh, Dene Apachean influence very late uh, as part of the southward migrations. Uh, and I think there's increasing evidence that the Shoshonean speakers, the Numic languages, have been in the area longer than we thought. That there's not a simple population replacement. And uh, just because this farming is later, it has to be Paiute farming and not Fremont farming. Um, I would invite people who find this to be intriguing to take a look at the opening chapter in Denny Seymour's book, uh, Fierce and Indomitable. This is exactly the uh, thing that she's tackling. Uh, and Stedman Upham was trying to do that earlier. And uh, I was trying to do it in the Great Basin. And oh, there we go. There's Denny's work. Non Puebloan people in the hinterlands among the Puebloan, a multi ethnic America. I also talk about this in my general book, Ancient Peoples of the Great Basin and Colorado Plateau, that came out in 2009. I hit this pretty explicitly. Uh, we we uh, I'm I'm very adamant about not using the archaeological cultures as uh, ethnic ethnic groups or language groups. I think we're on real dangerous ground there, especially when you start looking at the living analogies from history. It's not the way people act. Mm -hmm. So that that's my main uh, outrageous claim for the day. That, uh, Thank you. <laughs> so with the experimental archaeology that was done. Is there an estimate of how long it would take to construct a ditch? Like um, I forget her. I, I think if she, I forget the numbers, um, but I think she uh, set a group of uh, maybe 10 or 12 people uh, for uh, a, few, a couple of weeks could do this. Uh -huh. uh, somebody has to be present while they're using it because this system was fragile. And uh, where, where they let it drop down natural grades, you had a lot of erosion and you can, it's very dramatic today. It's all, these are all entrenched places, but they're odd because they're not where natural drainages would be. That's what confused me at, at, at when I first started going out there and hunting for this. Uh, I didn't realize that they weren't digging the whole thing. They constructed a, a ditch grade at one to 2%, let it go a few hundred meters, and then they'd let the water run down the hill. And I was seeing these arroyos. And I said, this is so odd. This doesn't look like a natural arroyo. It's not right. And I realized uh, these arroyos were connected to, to two sections of uh, constructed grade. Mm -hmm. Just so absolutely fascinating. Yeah, that's so interesting. So, well, it's a little after five, and I've got a bunch more questions. And I'm going to apologize to the people I can't get to. But I'm going to ask a couple of more. Um, let me see. One just went off my screen. So given what you just said about there being ditch and then no ditch connecting back to a ditch, I have a question of, was there any evidence of small spreader dams, such as brush dams, to slow down and spread water across a specific area? Or was the water flow so slow and the grade so limited that there was no need for that? 
Uh, I think there was was once, and we I would have, have I expected it, and we actually searched for them. Uh, they, there was there were no rock dams. We know that, uh, but there is there, a lot of the system. There's not a lot of rock around. Uh, so they were either earthen or, as you say, brush, and they're long gone. Uh, when they blow out, uh, they, they just left no uh, trace. What, what, we, what you find geomorphically is the, the two sections of constructed grade and the royal uh, between them. And in the area where they come together, it's just a jumbled, eroded basin. So you can imagine the water was rushing down there. And even it continued to do that after they stopped using the system because it's just natural rainwater. So over time, over the centuries, it's just literally trashed those areas. Um, a couple more, and then we're going to have to stop. Uh, but did you find evidence of a head gate or speculate on how they might have started and stopped the water flow? Uh, the head gate area is is completely destroyed because of the construction of a concrete head gate when they built the reservoir. We only know the area, uh, the general area, because it's a, it's a, we're an al it's an alpine meadow, and uh, it could have been above the modern head gate a little bit, a few meters, but it can't be below the modern head gate more than about 30 meters because the natural course of Pleasant Creek takes a hard left turn and dives off a 30 degree slope and literally cascades into this uh, canyon that is, uh, oh, what is that drop? About 150 meters deep sandstone canyon. So mm -hmm. that's the only place they can get the water. Um, you described how we could use GIS to predict areas where this type of irrigation system might work and that some student could go out and look at those areas and try to find these. Do you suspect that they're out there? Or is uh, this a one-off? That's where the cost benefit models are useful, that we were struck, so struck by the, the numbers that uh, the prediction would be is that they should be doing this wherever they can pull it off. Uh, I've, I've tried to kick off such a project uh, in my last years before retirement, but didn't get any takers. Um, but it's fairly simple. You use the tool in ArcGIS to, uh, uh, to find perennial water. And then a, a series of uh, one to 2% grades to transport the water to some known arable land. And what the tool will do is it'll spit out uh, a number of possibilities within a certain area. I've talked to some of the people that work in Range Creek to, uh, uh, with, with this in mind, to try to predict where we should go look. Um, but it's definitely amenable to that kind of uh, analysis using least cost pathway analysis. Given that some of your system had canals and some of it didn't, do you think there was Fremont or even Pueblo irrigation that would show no trace today? Yes. In fact, I think it's a real crapshoot to try to find this stuff. Uh, geologically, it's just so altered because of the nature of irrigation. Archaeologists are not accustomed to thinking about irrigation, uh, particularly in these remote areas on these small scales, uh, which is one of the reasons I couldn't understand it first. I just thought that it was going to be a continuous one to two percent grade the way we would construct it all the way up. And I kept I kept losing the trail. And uh, they're they're working on a different uh, model yep well steve thank you so much and once again i apologize to the people who wrote in questions that i didn't get to perhaps we'll be able to uh, answer some of those later uh, but it was a fascinating talk and it's really something that's important for the area where i work in southwestern colorado because as you you know there's some areas here that were probably ideal they are today for dry land farming that relies on direct precipitation and probably very little irrigation. But as you head into other parts of Southwestern Colorado, it just seems like you had to irrigate in order to have enough moisture for crops. And yet yeah. we haven't documented those systems 
in that area. So it's been a really fascinating talk for me. I learned a lot and uh, just really grateful that you would take the time to present in the Crow Canyon uh, webinar series. And, and as always, very grateful to our supporters who have been out there in the audience tonight. Uh, these, all you lifelong learners, uh, you're the ones that make this webinar series happen. And thank you for your support that has allowed us uh, to create this series. So I'll leave it to you, Steve, if you have any closing comments. Well, thank you for the opportunity. It's been fun. And I, I do have a web page uh, on the Utah State University website. And uh, if people want to email me with questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. Uh, so I think I've got uh, lots Taylor, of time. Taylor is out there and she uh, typically um, follows up with an email tomorrow. Taylor, do you want to can you make sure you get that web page address or is there something you want to follow up with uh, right now to say to people? Yeah, I'll go ahead and link his web page as well as his email on the follow up email that will be sent out to all of you guys. Uh, so if you have any further questions, you can reach out to Dr. Sims directly. And thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you, Taylor, for making it happen. Thank you, everybody. See you next Thursday.